Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. If you would have told me one year ago that there would be a pastor arrested and jailed for conducting a church service, I would not have guessed that the country you were talking about was Canada. And I would not have guessed that the province would be Alberta and that the government would be one that at least in name calls itself conservative and that is led by a Christian himself, Jason Kenney. But alas, all those things have come true. In the case of Pastor James Coates, the pastor of a large church west of Edmonton called the Grace Life Church. See, the thing about Pastor Coates is he thinks that a church should have the same rights as, oh, say, a big box store like Walmart or Costco or even in Alberta. The restaurants are open again, but that is not the view of the unelected, unaccountable public health officer of the province who has issued orders not only shutting down the church, but since the pastor himself refuses to comply, he's being prosecuted and he sits in jail to this day. No legislature has approved this, no elected official. It's all being done by a power-mad bureaucrat, a member of the public health deep state, Dr. Dina Hinshaw. We're joined now by one of the few civil liberties lawyers in the country who even care about this. You'll know exactly who I'm talking about. It's our friends at the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedom. And the lawyer we're talking with today is James Kitchen, who's in Calgary. James, great to see you again. First of all, thank you for taking this case. We take some cases at Rebel News. We've started our Fight the Vines project, but you guys have been fighting for civil liberties for a decade now. I salute you. Thanks. You are the lawyer for Pastor James Coates. Have I accurately recited the basic facts of the case? The basic facts, yes. Um, there's, there's a lot of details to fill in, but that's, that's the basic situation. Well, why don't you give me some more details? I have in front of me your press release. I understand that the police came, gave him a ticket, said shut her down. He didn't. They didn't arrest him right then. The next week they came. They said shut her down. He didn't. They said sign this undertaking, which is like a legal promise that you'll shut her down. He refused to sign. Then they arrested him, charged him, prosecuted him for breaking his undertaking, which he actually never signed. And because he still won't bend the knee, he still won't say, yes, I will shut down my church. He sits in jail and will, for at least another week, waiting for a hearing. Are those some of the details? And, and, I, and please jump in now, fill in the gaps. I don't want to get it wrong. I want to hear from you, the lawyer. No, that's, that's essentially it. Uh, he was charged with breaching an undertaking, which is a, which is a serious uh, criminal code charge. Um, but of course, the undertaking of that, uh, the validity of the, of the undertaking is questionable at best because he didn't agree with it. What's supposed to happen um, when you're arrested, if you don't agree to an undertaking, you're supposed to be brought to a justice of the peace right then and there. So when he was arrested on the 7th, and it wasn't really an arrest, it was just a meeting in his office at the church, the RCMP left that detail out. Um, what should have happened when he refused at that point to sign the undertaking is he should have gone before the JP right then and there. The RCMP didn't do that. They waited a week. And then he held church again, and then they charged him with breaching that undertaking, um, which is really not the way it should have been done. So, uh, you know, in the justice of the peace at, at the bail hearing that occurred here on Tuesday, uh, generally agreed with that. And um, that and a number of other reasons decided that uh, it, it wasn't uh, appropriate to uh, to detain him. Uh, interesting enough, though, that the prosecution did ask the JP to, to detain him. Um, as far as the prosecution was concerned, he, he, was, a, he was a menace to the public. Huh. Um, you know, and, and, and the prosecution said that it, was, it would actually be uh, bringing the administration of justice into disrepute to, uh, to, to release him. I mean, obviously, I, I, I feel it's the other way around. I think it's a stain on the administration of justice for putting a pastor in jail for holding church. So anyways, the, the, the JP did release him, but under the condition that he stopped holding church as he had been doing. Um, and of course, obviously, that violates his conscience to to agree to that. So, um, without uh, without a, uh, agreeing to the to the condition for release, he can't be released, and so he's in jail. Wow. Now, let me just ask a question. It's been a while since I practiced law. I did practice in Edmonton, uh, which is uh, I, I presume that's the judicial center that has been carrying this case. Am I right? Uh, Parkland County does it have its own court, or is this in court in Edmonton? 
Well, it was in it was in Stony Plain, which is right beside Edmonton, and and, and now he's been taken to the Edmonton Remand Center. So when I was a young lawyer, I did some lawyering at the Remand Center, probably the old one. It is one of the worst facilities you could uh, be put into, at least back in the day when I was a young lawyer in Edmonton. First of all, it was a maximum security facility. It's where people were taken right off the streets. They may still be drunk. They may still be drugged up. They may have come straight from a fight. Literally, murderers are held there pending their disposition. That's my memory of the Edmonton Remand Center when I practiced law there more than 20 years ago. Is the pastor in a high security facility with violent criminals? I hope not. To be perfectly honest, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I haven't had a chance to talk to him since he's gone there. I talked to him when he was still at the station yesterday, just before he left. I haven't had a chance to connect with him since. Um, you know, one of the first things I'm going to ask him is is how how he's doing and and how he's being treated there. Uh, unfortunately, um, on top of the fact that he's in jail, they they of course put him in this 14 uh, day um, isolation, which is basically solitary confinement because of their you know, ridiculous COVID restrictions. So normally he, he he would eventually be entitled to some sort of visit or contact with his wife. Well, he can't have that right now because of the COVID restrictions. So it's kind of jail on top of jail and um, just, you know, to, to, add, to add salt to the wound. So that's, that's unfortunate. Um, you know, he's, he's, but he's obviously a very courageous man. He's in there out of principle, um, you know, and uh, he's got his Bible with him. And um, so I, he's, uh, I think, I think he's probably doing all right. I certainly hope so. And I look forward to talking to him again. Well, I look forward to an update on that. I have visited a man in prison before who was in solitary confinement, and I can tell you that a day in solitary confinement is like a week or a month in regular jail. Uh, the mind plays tricks on you. It's the isolation. And when I visited someone in solitary, frankly, the first 20 minutes of the conversation, the person in solitary was not all there. Uh, the, the stress of dealing with a person after being really in an isolation tank. That is a form of torture. Solitary confinement has been called a form of torture. Um, and the fact that he doesn't have visits even from his own wife, which I don't understand because, of course, he's living with his wife. Why would he have to be separated from his wife in prison? They were both just, it makes no sense to me other than as a punitive example to any other pastor who would dare stop worshiping Dina Hinshaw, the unelected, unaccountable public health bureaucrat. And, and that comes to my next point. I don't believe in police meddling with police, uh, with, with politicians meddling with police. We have to have some sort of separation. We don't want what we see in Toronto, where the mayor commands the, the police like they're his toy soldiers. It's a terrible thing. But in this case, where it's so obviously a political fight, where the charter of rights are so obviously being violated, you need someone with better judgment, a more well-rounded judgment, and with democratic legitimacy to step in and say, you Alberta health bureaucrats who are having the time of your life, you've gone too far. And public health is important, but we're balancing that with not just any old freedom, but our fundamental freedoms. And I note the freedom of religion is the very first freedom in the charter, even ahead of freedom of speech, even ahead of freedom of the press, freedom of conscience and belief and religion. And I think it is a blemish on Alberta whose motto is strong and free, that a Christian pastor rots in solitary confinement for 14 days because some bureaucrat says Walmart can open but not your church. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's dark times. Um, you know that is that is something. If, if if we weren't the boiling frog right now, we'd probably be more shocked because I mean the idea of a pastor being thrown in jail uh, is so utterly antithetical and foreign to a nation that purports to be free and democratic. I mean that's something you expect to hear uh, from uh, from China or North Korea. We we often do hear it, right? And and hopefully that's. Uh, that's ringing some bells for people to think, okay, I'm, I'm hearing now something that's happening on a regular basis in a totalitarian dystopian nightmare like uh, China and North Korea. <clears throat> Maybe that means that there's something wrong with what with, with our country right now that purports to not be uh, a totalitarian dystopian nightmare. 
Now, I know Jason Kenny. I've known him uh, on a personal level for, frankly, most of my adult life. Uh, it was that same time I was up in Edmonton going to law school and then practicing law that I met him. So w we go way back. And I've always known him to be an advocate for religious freedom. In fact, I think he was instrumental in the creation of the Office of Religious Freedom under Stephen Harper. I find it very um, contradictory that the greatest violation of religious freedom in Canada also happens to be in the province of which he's premier. I know the JCCF, your Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, has written to Premier Kenny asking him to intervene and, and to countermand his out-of-control health bureaucrats. Have you had any response? Your letter was sent yesterday. Have you had any response from the Premier's office? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I, I certainly hope for a response, but I, I, uh, I'm not overly expectant. Um, you know, that's what's one of the problems is, is not just Kenny, but in general, we, we see a lack of responsiveness from uh, governments, uh, you know, from the pleas of their people that, that are crying out about the economic devastation and the loss of their liberties. Um, there seems to be a lot of indifference and, and a lot of callousness. I mean, obviously they say otherwise, but I, I judge people by their actions and the actions of governments are that they really don't care about their people at all. Right. Um, and now, of course, they say they do because right, the COVID restrictions are all about saving lives. Meanwhile, uh, the restrictions themselves are destroying far more human life, whether it's whether it's through life itself, people dying because they can't get their medical care or, you know, through the through the economic loss, the relational loss, the mental health devastation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I uh, you know, it's, it's in the name of compassion that governments seem to be uh, destroying their own people. Um, so, well. I mean, if I can make one more reference to my glory days as a lawyer, um, I recall that, you know, under our Constitution, we have these lists of fundamental freedoms. I mentioned a few of them earlier. Uh, but even before that, our, our Charter of Rights says that they may be infringed only if it's demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. So there are some limits on our freedoms. But I, I do remember from law school that it's a very high test that the government has to make. There was a case called the Oaks Test, uh, the, the Oaks, and it's being called the Oaks Test. The infringements have to be proportionate. I don't think throwing a pastor in, in solitary confinement for two weeks is proportionate. They have to be rationally connected to the pressing and substantial problem. I don't know how shutting down a church, but not shutting down a, a, a Costco is rational. And finally, pressing and substantial, I mentioned that a moment ago, I see that the cases of the, of the virus in Alberta are plummeting. I mean, forget about the fact that Trudeau hasn't brought in any vaccines. This thing's going away. Like, it's down more than 50% in just a couple weeks. Uh, out there in, in uh, west of Edmonton, it is not a hot spot. So even if there was a factual rationale for this, let's say a month or two ago, it's gone now. I mean, the pandemic's pretty much over. So I think that if there even was a charter rationale for this bizarre, punitive, and selective lockdown, it's no longer there. What do you think of my back of a napkin analysis on the Oaks test? Well, we could spend a, lot, <clears throat> a long time on this, but ultimately what it comes down to is, is the judges, right? Mm -hmm. The judges get to interpret section one. And if you look at the last 20 years, 20, 25 years, um, the Section 1 test itself hasn't changed, but how it's been interpreted and used and applied by judges has changed. Um, that threshold you mentioned as being very high, it once was. It no longer is. In practice, in reality, when you go to the court, it no longer is. Huh. The court has somewhat become a rubber stamp for government action um, instead of, instead of you know, that, uh, that lever of accountability. And that's that's ultimately the problem, right? Um, we would we I think we'd be seeing more of these restrictions uh, struck down as not being justified under Section One, if 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 the court um, you know was 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 ruling in the same way that it did in the 80s and 90s when the charter first came out, hmm. right? I I don't think this would have flown if if if, if this was 88, um, and people like uh, Yakabuchi was was still on the bench uh, of the Supreme Court. I don't. I don't, I don't, and, and, and Justice Major was probably the most pro-freedom justice we had at the advent of the charter. 
I don't I don't think you would have saw this uh, this go through. That's an excerpt from my daily show, The Ezra Levant Show. Every day I do a monologue on the news of the day, then I interview an interesting guest, and then I read my hate mail. You gotta subscribe. Go to rebelnews.com.